Thinking in Dark Times is a podcast series by Ukraine World. In this episode, I speak to Luke Harding, the Guardian's correspondent on Ukraine, Russia and Eastern Europe, about his experience of covering the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the atrocities of the Russian army and Ukrainian political identity. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko, I'm a Ukrainian philosopher, journalist and chief editor of ukraineworld.org. Ukraine World is a popular website in English about Ukraine, run by Ukrainians. It is brought to you by Internews Ukraine, one of the biggest Ukrainian media NGOs. The series Thinking in Dark Times aims to make Ukraine and the current war a focal point of our common reflection about the world's present, past and future. We try to see light through and despite the current darkness. You can support us at patreon.com slash ukraineworld. So, let's start. Luke Harding, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So, you all have been reporting a lot about Russia, Ukraine and the whole region. And you are one of those journalists who are the most present here, probably. When you look at this war, how do you describe it? I, I think it's, um, it's a sort of 19th century uh, imperial war of conquest. I mean, it, it's interesting how many phases the, 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 the Kremlin, or, or let's, let's call it what it is, it's Vladimir Putin's war, ha, has been through. I mean, initially, it was a special military operation um, with preposterous goals to, to denazify and demilitarize Ukraine, whatever that means. I mean, it, it seems strange given the fact that Ukraine is not run by neo-Nazis and has a Jewish president. But that, that was the kind of rationale to begin with. And, and then after the debacle um, uh, around Kiev, when, when Russia tried and failed in February and March to, to, to seize the Ukrainian capital, we then got a new term, which was to, to liberate the Donbass. But also that didn't really make any sense either, because a lot of the territory um, Russian forces had seized in the south and Kherson and Zaporizhia. Uh, and, and indeed around Kharkiv, where I've been recently, w- w- was not the Donbass. Um, and, and now we seem to be we now seem to be going to sort of stage three, where um, Putin uh, announces that he's annexing these regions, they're now part of, of, of Russia, and that this essentially aggressive war um, has, has become a sort of reactive war to defend Russian territory in inverted commas from, 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 from the West, from, from, uh, from Ukraine, uh, from America and uh, and so on. And there's what I see is a kind of ideological incoherency behind this project, which I think is one of the reasons that it's failing. But you call it Putin's war, but at the same time we see overwhelming support in the Russian society. And you have lived in Russia for, for many years. I think you told me that you have left earlier than even 2014. Is that right? Well, I mean, a left isn't quite the right verb. I'm, you were I mean, expelled. I was kicked yeah. out by the Federal Security Service, the FSB, Putin's old, old spy agency, and, and deported from the country, put in a cell. At, so at, you, uh, you were declared a foreign agent, right? Something well, like I, that. I don't even think... They, uh, the, the thing is, they never really explain what your crime is, again, in inverted co- commas, uh, but I think they were unhappy with my reporting over four years. I mean, I was based in Moscow as the bureau chief for The Guardian from 2007 until 2011. Um, and what I did was I, I reported on a whole series of taboo subjects. One of them was just posing the question, how much money does Vladimir Putin have? Which was an extremely unwanted question. I mean, I'll answer, he's the richest man in the world who presides over a state, not a bank account. Also, I investigated the um, assassination in uh, the autumn of 2006 of Alexander Litvinenko, a kind of FSB whistleblower who was poisoned in London um, with a radioactive craft of tea. Uh, a- another taboo theme. And finally, I travelled to the North Caucasus where, where there was an underreported war going on between Islamist rebels and local and federal security forces. And um, yeah, I mean, it was quite a saga. That was my first book, Mafia State. Mafia state, and I think that that description, that terminology, still applies to to the Russian regime. Although there are other things also one can say about it. But when you're looking at the Russian society, how do you explain the overwhelming support for this war? 
Uh, it's we can call it Putin's war, we can call it mafia's war, but we Ukrainians tend to look broader and say, okay, this is not only Putin's war. Not Putin comes to 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 our land. Not Putin himself kills our our people, uh, rapes our women. And uh, unfortunately, since the beginning of this special military operation, the support for this war has increased in Russia. So do you think that the majority, the real majority of the Russian society is actually supporting this war? Well, uh, the, the great um, poet and writer, uh, Cheslov Miwash, uh, wrote a, a stunning book uh, about, about Stalinism, communism, called The Captive Mind. And I think what we have in Russia is we have we have millions of captive minds, uh, and you have some people for sure who oppose the war. I would say it's a, it's a vociferous minority, and you, you have what you might also say is a vociferous minority that supports the war actively, genuinely, ideologically, believes it, and and that, then the rest is this sort of passive middle. It's a very large middle that that acquiesces, that that watches Russian television, that that. To some extent, um, shares the, the the prejudices that have been drummed into into Russians over a period of decades that Ukrainians are are not people, that they are Nazis, that they are American puppets, that they, in the words of Dmitry Medvedev, that they are vassals. This kind of a, a rootless, almost subhuman uh, group, not not a nation. Uh, floating around without agency in in a, in a territory which Putin says is historical Russia and has to be redeemed in, in the manner of the annexations of the 1930s done by Hitler in Sudetenland and elsewhere. So, so I think I think the simple answer is propaganda. Propaganda works. Uh, the, the Russians are, are very bad at many things, but they are good at propaganda and what what they sort of regard as kind of informational um a- a- activity and uh, and also there's, there's definitely a sort of postmodern uh, aspect to all this which is that putin doesn't believe in anything he doesn't believe in truth it's a, it's, a, it's, a sort of, it's very much a sort of kgb attitude he he is what you might call a sort of supreme nihilist he's probably the, the he's probably the, the the world's foremost exponent of nihilism and and he thinks that if you if you send a particular message repeat it enough society will follow and to some extent that has been borne out and the the problem the real world problem is that this fantastical thinking acquires a sort of certain psychological valency to the, to the extent that you go out in the street and you ask ordinary Russians what they think of Ukraine and they just repeat what they've what they've said what they've seen on Russian television so it, it, it works on some psychological level. The problem I think that Putin now faces is, is, is the gap between his sort of fictive version of the war in Ukraine and, and what's actually happening is so large that, that you can see it falling apart at the seams. When you have been to Russia, uh, have you seen any sign of hope? that there is a kind of way out in, in, a, in, a, in a sense that there are some forces in the Russian society that can really produce change, the real democratic change. Because when we look at Russian's history, my problem, the Ukrainian's problem, is that we don't see much of the hope. Because there were many revolutions, uh, many protests in Russia, like Decembrist a revolt in early 19th century, Bolshevik Revolution, 1991... All of them brought some changes or tried to bring some changes, but all of them ended up in an even more horrible totalitarianism. It's a, it's a really interesting question, uh, and I, I think there are, there are several ways of answering it. I mean, you, you're right. If you look at the sweep of Russian history, you, you have <clears throat> repression, totalitarianism, patrimonialism. You, you had in the 19th century the most conservative um, imperial monarchy in Europe. Um, and then you have these brief anarchistic moments of democracy you know grass level uprisings uh where where you think okay you know m- maybe russia c- can become a normal uh, progressive society and and then you have as we saw in the 1990s with putin you have a a really concerted counter revolution uh led by the kgb whose figurehead became vladimir putin um a, 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 who essentially regarded the the end of the collapse of the soviet union as a well what was putin's phrase this is a geopolitical catastrophe and essentially, it was a restorationist project which saw um, 
authoritarianism restored and 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 saw saw this kind of mashup between between imperialism and and Sovietism and 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 essentially the sort of common theme was 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 that Russia sh- should and will always be a great power um, that, that it, make Russia great again that that was that's if if Putin has a philosophy it's that so so that's where we're at but. Um, weighed against that, I, I don't. I don't think we should be teleological. I, I don't think we should fall into into what Putin has done, which is the, the, the trap of messianic thinking. I, I, in the modern age of instant communication, of of Viber, of Facebook, okay, it's banned in Russia, of of, of Twitter. Uh, there's there's nothing which I think means that Russia can never be a democracy. And, you know, we, we've seen brave people in, in Russia. We've seen, obviously, Alexei Navalny, but but other people as well. Some of the journalists I've worked with doing investigations into, into Kremlin money, most of them, you have to say, who are now in exile, they've all fled. Uh, th- there are principled, um, educated, moral people um, who who have not lost their critical faculties um, who are who are who who wants and an, you know working for a, a better future? The problem is at the moment they're dealing with an extremely repressive police state. They're dealing with, I would say, totalitarianism, and it's very hard to to make inroads at the moment. You wrote the mafia state, and uh, the concept of the mafia is very interesting. So, do you think that there is there can be an opposition inside this mafia? Because when we are thinking, we are looking for for the signs of hope, how the regime can change in Russia. One of the possibilities is the popular protest doesn't really work like that. Another possibility is a coup d'etat inside this mafia state. Do you believe it is possible? Well, I, I mean... Look, I, I've been I've been living in Russia, reporting on it, writing about it, writing books about it for 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 a long time, and and this this is this is the the unicorn. <laughs> we see this unicorn, <laughs> or we imagine we see this unicorn, kind of at the edge of the hill, and I, I'm not sure, unfortunately, that the the the, the unicorn exists. I, th- I think the most likely scenario for regime change in Russia is is for Putin to exit horizontally, Leonid Brezhnev style, in 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 a coffin. And now, having said that, it's clear the war is going very badly. That that his assumptions about Ukrainians um, being rural Russians who who would welcome their liberators with bread and salt and with flowers, obviously that 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 didn't happen. And and we see this kind of period now of escalation and doubling down, which is sort of classically um, Putinist. So I I I, I don't see um I don't I don't see a palace coup scenario unfortunately and, and and the problem is also our thinking is shaped by by film by drama by by our need for coherent narrative by i would say the death of stalin the hilarious black uh, amanda ianucci comedy we sort of think it's going to be like the death of stalin and and unfortunately you, you talk about mafia state what you have to understand about these guys is it's not just that they're gangsters they're provincial gangsters they're not even big town gangsters they're sort of small petty stupid, vicious, nasty, uneducated gangsters who have seized the state. And uh, yes, there is a parliament. Yes, there is sort of politics. Yes, there are referendum. But but nothing is real, to, to, to take a phrase from Peter Pomerantsov's book, a great, great writer on, on Ukraine. It's, it's all... It's all meta. It's it's all it's all a play. Um, Putin's speech today is a play, um, uh, uh, but but you know keep keep that gangster idea um, in your head because it just explains so much of what what Russia is doing both at home and internationally. But what you're saying is when you're saying that the only exit is uh, Putin's death, that means that the only causes that can change the situation are natural causes. And uh, there is no drama inside, because if you take a classical drama, if you take Shakespeare, mm. right? Uh, I don't know, Hamlet, Macbeth, uh, King Lear, everything is happening because of human deeds in the drama, in, in the tragedy. Nothing is happening because somebody's death or, I don't know, hurricanes or whatever. If the world, if the human world is, is driven by hurricanes and natural forces, there is no society. So you are saying that Russia has no society, not a civil society which can protest, not even the society inside mafia that can challenge the dictator? 
No, I, I, I'm not saying there's no civil society. There is civil society. It, it's just it's been violently suppressed. And, and certainly when I was in Moscow, it was pretty vibrant. You know, I, I would go to demonstrations held by Gary Kasparov, uh, n- now in exile, along with many other people. Um, I would go to parties um, for, for Nova Gazeta, uh, the opposition newspaper now shut down and, and, and declared illegal. I mean, the society is, is there. It's, 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 under the, uh, it's under the surface. So, so no, uh, and, and just to be clear, I, I'm not totally ruling out a kind of non-natural death for, for Putin. I just, I, I, how that ha- might happen, I don't know. I mean, we, we've done a sort of series of popular video explainers uh, on the Guardian website where I basically talk about how we, how we, how we got here. Um, they've, they've done a lot of views. Uh, and at the end of the most recent one, I say, I say, yeah, this is a Shakespearean drama. And I think we're in Act 5. I think this is the end of Putin. Uh, I think we're in Act Five, Scene One or Scene Two. So three more acts to go. So, so that it, you know, the drama will lead, will end inevitably, as all dramas do, with with Putin dead on the stage. How that happens, when that happens, we don't know. But my feeling is we are towards the end. Let's let's talk about the probably the last aspect mm-hmm. about my questions about Russia, and then we turn to Ukraine. Russia is not a national state, a nation state. It is an empire, multinational empire. I think one of the illusions in the West, of course not people like you, but many other people who just misread Russia, is to consider Russia as a nation state, which it is not. It is an empire which collects lots of ethnicities inside its body. Uh, do you think that these ethnicities can one day challenge the the central hierarchy? We see the protests in Dagestan. We see something might be going on in in, uh, in Chechnya, in Buryatia. But still, my I, my personal impression is is that is still too weak. What is your impression? I I, I would agree with that. I mean, when I was in Kharkiv uh, recently, I um, was wandering around outside the the, the smashed by Russian missile regional state administration headquarters on Freedom Square. Uh, and there's a little um there's a little sort of booth there, uh, you know, with pro Ukraine. I remember this booth. Yes. Yeah. And there's a map on it. There's a map of the Russian Federation, which which uh, I mean it, it's it's sort of playful, but it but it pro- projects Russia's collapse and, and shows various sort of breakaway entities, whether it's the Baratias, as you say, or, or the, the people in Yakutia, or obviously the Chechens, the Dagestanis. And then very mischievously, for some reason, it has it has Kamchatka as part of America next to some kind of faraway Ukrainian territory. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's basically, it's a form of cartographic trolling. Um, and Look, I've talked to I've talked to people like Viktor Savorov, who who's an interesting guy. He's a he's a former GRU um, intelligence officer who defected a long time ago, back in the nineteen seventies, and then wrote a series of best selling books about Russian intelligence, in, including the the uh, including Aquarium um, about his old employer, the GRU. I mean, when I've talked to him, he he's described Russia as suffering from a cancer, and and he thinks inevitably the state will collapse and fracture into these into these like a sort of kaleidoscope into these sort of multi, new multi ethnic identities. But I, I would say I don't see that happening anytime soon. I think, I think these kind of national minorities are too weak. Uh, I think they're, they're they're unhappy. But but look, you know, the two wars in Chechnya were not so long ago, uh, and look at the price that Chechnya paid for trying to to break free from from Moscow's imperial grip. It was a huge and terrible price, uh, and it's a salutary warning to any other group thinking of doing the same. When you look at this question, I think you understand why Putin hates Lenin and why he says that Lenin invented Ukraine, etc. Because if you look at the concept of the Soviet Union, not only of the Soviet Union, but also of the Russian Federation of Lenin uh, in the 1920s, it was considered as a very multinational state in which each of these ethnicities were giving its own chance to develop its culture. And maybe... Uh, this would lead to a genuine, well, I would not say genuine because I hate Lenin as I do Stalin, but uh, uh, Lenin, of course, his conception of, uh, of this national question was much more, um, much more, much less authoritarian or totalitarian as Stalinist or Putin's. Yeah, and I think it was a, <clears throat> a reaction to what he regarded as, as a, you know, Russian imperialist chauvinism and, and, and said that, yeah, there was a nationalities policy that was... 
I don't know if you call it Ukrainization, but but the, the, the Ukrainian language was allowed to be spoken, written, published, and and it was there was a recognition too that Ukraine was was fundamental to this new Soviet project of of, of republics, and and of course Putin hates that because what Putin has been doing um, has been reviving classical the cl- classical Russian imperial thinking of the eighteen twenties and eighteen thirties uh, of narodness of of of, of, of this kind of spiritual Russian civilizational nation and space um, of of autocracy, um, and so so yeah, he hates Lenin. I mean, what what, what I I've written about this for the Guardian, but what what I find so striking is that yes, he hates Lenin, but but you you roam around you know occupied territories, and what do they do? They put Lenin's statue back, back up in in Genichesk, and you think, well, hang on a minute, this is the guy who Putin says is to blame for modern Ukraine being refated in in provincial town squares across Kherson and Lugansk and, and 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 so on and it goes back to my earlier point that that there is no coherent ideological project here for, from Putin it is just his messianic desire as, as the clock ticks on his life he's about to be 70 to go down in history as Ivan the Terrible or Peter the Great or or, or Stalin and if, in fact, the, the, the reverse is happening. I mean, he's he's going to go down in history as as a as a reckless, uh, cold, uh, socio, sociopathic um, adventurer who, I think, ultimately will lose everything. Yeah, this is the problem because when Russians look at their history, they don't see the the examples of, of, of democracy. That's the problem. We Ukrainians see that. We see it in, in Ukrainian People's Republic in early 20th century. We see in the Cossack statehood. We see in medieval Rus, whatever. But this is another question. Let's talk about Ukraine. Your new book is about Ukraine, this war. Can you tell me about it? Yeah, so my, my, my book is called Invasion, uh, the inside story of um, <clears throat> Russia's bloody war and Ukraine's fight for survival. And it's being published in November by Vintage in New York, uh, by Faber and Faber in London. And uh, I am thrilled to say by Vivat uh, in Kharkiv. So there'll be a Ukrainian translation. It's been translated at the moment. And I, it's it's basically, it's the first <clears throat> uh, book, you know, reported from the front line of, inside Ukraine of, of, of what's been happening. And I... I kind of, I don't know if the word is is mania, but but I, I, I mean, just to scroll back a bit, I mean, uh, when when Putin was sending troops to the border in the autumn of last year, I was convinced that some kind of large scale military operation was going to happen at a time when quite a lot of people in the West um, were skeptical and thought that this was just a kind of wrong analysis, and and just as a sort of veteran. Putin watcher. If if there if there are two paths, uh, a bad path and a really terrible path, always bet on the really terrible because th- that that is what Putin will do. And um, and so I you know I came here in December. I, I made a film on the front line outside Donetsk air, uh, airport with Ukrainian troops. Uh, we got shot at by a by a Russian sniper who who happily missed us. Uh, uh, and, th- and then in Kiev in January, uh, at a time actually when many Ukrainians were also not really convinced that something was going to happen, I-, I was talking to people, meeting people, and they were all saying, Mariupol, Mariupol, Mariupol. You know, y- yes, we can hold some territory, but Mariupol looks really vulnerable. So I went to Mariupol, went to the front line with the DNR, talked to Ukrainian troops, <sighs> you know, drove past Azovstal, uh, um, I went to a, I went to a restaurant on the, on a Saturday evening, and um, I keep thinking about this scene because it was late January of 2022, and um, it was a sort of classic scene where there was a live band, there was a woman singing in Russian and in English, and all of the guys were were were, were seated round a table, uh, awkwardly looking at the women dancing, having a good time with each other. I mean, it sort of, sort of happens everywhere, and. That morning, I'd been to the the Mariupol Aerodrome and I'd seen a sort of patriotic performance done by a kind of theatre troupe um, where they'd done a sort of, they'd done, I think it's called Vertep, they'd done a sort of a, a kind of a mystery play updated with, with Putin, with death, with an angel, you know, with guitar singing. And uh, Putin had been kicked up the bottom and booted off to hell. And... I write about this in Invasion because I keep thinking of that scene because when I think of those women dancing, I, 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 I call this fantastical, call, call this ridiculous, but I see the figure of death 
before me because I, I've never been, you know, I've, I've reported on a lot of war. I, I, I you know, did the war in, in Iraq, uh, uh, Afghanistan first time around. I've, I did the war in Georgia in 2008. I, w- I was in Libya, in Syria. Um, I was in Donetsk and Luhansk in 2014. Um, but I've never been to a city w- where I visit it and two months later it ceases to exist. I mean, this by by the, the benighted standards of twentieth and twenty first century history, this is unprecedented that you can exterminate a place of of nearly half a million people. So so there is nothing, and there are thousands of bodies under rubble. And this book was easy to write because what I wanted to do was to explain the international politics. Of course, the the the, the big picture that this extraordinary anti-Russian coalition which has taken shape, the, the, the way the world has changed, that the Germans have abandoned pacifism, the, the Finns and the Swedes have, Swedes have dumped neutrality and uh, are joining NATO. There's been some rapprochement between the Brits and, and the Europeans. Um, the, the, the Poles and, and even the Hungarians have welcomed millions of Ukrainian refugees. So the, the world has changed. This is a transformational moment. It's a turning point. But what I wanted to tell in this book were the human stories of people I met in Mariupol, some of whom disappeared. I assume they're dead. I can't reach them. Of Bucha. I went to Bucha in April and I, it haunts me still. I, I, went to, I went to go and see a woman whose nephew had been, uh, uh, w- when the Russians rolled into her street, they, they took, took her nephew away for interrogation, told her that he was okay, that he'd been taken to Belarus. And then, of course, they departed chaotically at the end of March. Uh, and she found her nephew, and he had been held in a in a cold, dark, terrifying basement for several days by his Russian captors, who one night had come down the steps, uh, made him kneel, and had shot him in the ear and left his body there. And I went to that basement. I write about that basement. And, of course, there have been so many tragedies. There's been so much horror. There's been... I mean, you know, it's it's been it's it, 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 for everybody. No, nobody has not been touched by this, and and Ukrainians first and foremost. But what I wanted to do was tell some of those human stories, so that people, I mean, people here get it, of course, but people outside understood uh, the magnitude of this horror, and could could see it not as politics, but could respond to it with with compassion and with empathy. You went to Izum recently, and Izum is another place near Kharkiv where there is also a mass grave of over 400 bodies. And uh, it is now called as the second Bucha, something like this. Do you think, can you, can you first describe maybe what have you seen and what stories have you heard? And... Uh, if I tell you that every place that Russians have occupied can have these places like Bucha and Izum, will you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I will. I mean, I, I reached Izum a couple of days after they began exhuming bodies from this cemetery uh, right next to a kind of, what, what, basically in a Russian base um, in Pine Forest, so at a checkpoint just at the entrance to Izum. Uh and it was it was another one of those haunting scenes that I think will stay 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 with me. I mean, it, what was so so strange about it was it was beautiful. It's it's a it's a wonderful tranquil pine forest with orange bark trees, with with clean air, with a sort of sandy path. And you walk down this track, and you you see where the Russians had da- dug um, sort of tank holes and where they'd been living. Um, they'd they'd rather made these rather neat shelters with 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 thick branches um, and there's an established cemetery there uh, and there's a new part of the cemetery with about 450 bodies in it and I just I just watched as um, forensic officers from from Kharkiv police and so on dug and pulled out corpses and and you watch the corpse come out and then you see it's got it's got boots and it's got military uniform and then you're looking you know has it has the corpse got hands tied or not? The, the ones I saw didn't, but they were clearly soldiers, and, and how they died has yet to be determined. Um, and it was a terrible scene. And I, I, I met I met people from a Zoom who whose relatives were not soldiers, but who'd been killed. You know, who'd come to report deaths. Who, who'd one guy who'd went to look for his wife, who was killed in May by a cluster bomb, and and he said, um, 
oh, she's in plot number 333. And I said, well, look, you know, I, I think it's down there on the right. You know, so he, I didn't go with him because I didn't feel that was appropriate. And he went off and then he found the body of his wife and, and um, came back crying. And, and then the same day I went up to, um, I met someone, a local journalist, um, and he showed me around the police station and the room where he'd been tortured by Russian soldiers. He was arrested in April when, when the Russians first swept into a Zoom and he was rearrested at the beginning of September. And he was, in a way, he was quite fortunate. The reason he was alive was he spent seven months, seven, seven, sorry, he spent seven days in this torture chamber and prison and was then liberated by Ukrainian forces. So, and we, we saw the cell where he was with two other men. We saw the ledge where he said three rats lived. So he, there, were, there were rats, there was a ledge. His waters were from l and they, they, they were kind of local auxiliaries. Um, his tormentors were Russians. Uh, he, a bag was put over his head. He was led into a room that he subsequently identified, which was used as a firing range. It had, it had padded walls, so sand did not escape. There the, were the, the holes in the walls where they'd been shooting. And he, he showed me the chair where he'd been sat. Um, and... To answer your question, what was interesting was that the, the way they tortured him was using a Soviet military field telephone. It was real old school torture. So, so one guy wound this thing up and shocked him. But, so they att attached a crocodile clip to his fingers with, with a cable. And you had to sort of, there was physical effort involved. They wound this thing up and then they shocked him. Then he collapsed. Then they revived him. Then they repeated it. And what we've seen uh, in the whole of Kharkiv Oblast is similar similar setup with a field telephone um uh, about 18 torture chambers and yes uh, it's systemic it's um it's ordered from the top there is a manual people are taught how to do this professionally um it it is yes individuals are doing it but basically it's the state that's doing it and i have no doubt that that you know when uh Cheson, other territories are liberated more torture chambers will be found and, and more horror stories will emerge so you are saying that these tortures are not some, you know, contingent edge uh, act actions by the uh, by the people on the ground, by the soldiers. That it's, they not, are, it's not freelance. Yeah, that they are ordered from above. Is that what you're saying? It's ordered from above. And it, it, the, the method is the same pretty much everywhere. I, I mean, the, the, there, are, there are differences. I mean, for example, I've just been talking to a, a priest uh, who went to Snake Island um, in February to, to retrieve the bodies of dead Ukrainian um, soldiers and border guards, who turned out not to be dead. They were prisoners of war. And he was, he, he was himself uh, arrested, if you can call it that, um, taken to Russia and uh, incarcerated in a detention center in, in, in Staryaskol in the Belgorod region. And he told me that he was tortured with, a, with an electric cattle, uh, cattle prod. So that they actually had a slightly more sophisticated thing. But there was a pattern. They would ask him a question, then they would beat him. So it was question, beat, question, beat. And he said they were very professional. They were well-trained in what they did. When you're talking to Ukrainians, uh, because... I also travel a lot across Ukraine. I'm, I'm talking to people who experienced occupation. And uh, two things uh, surprise me. The first thing is that these people are, seems to be very often stronger than before. So they really feel that they came through some very terrible, horrible things. And they are nothing to afraid. They have nothing to afraid. Uh, and second thing that... I see how ordinary people become extraordinary, how they do extraordinary things, how they really literally become heroic. Do you, do you have the same impressions or maybe some others? I, I mean, I, 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 I do. And it's funny because you, you don't know uh, until you're sort of tested. I mean, the, the, the problem is when you talk about this, you, you, it's quite easy to sort of fall into, into quasi-religious language. But... but and until, until you're tested, you don't know how you're going to respond. And it's been really interesting. One of the stories I was trying to do in the Harkov Oblast was to um, explore, sort of tease out who resisted and who collaborated. Uh, because people, unfortunately, people did collaborate. You know, it, you, you, we'd like to think that all, all Ukrainians are heroic resistors, but actually, no. Some people let themselves be co-opted. A few because they believed it, that they, they had bought the kind of Russian propaganda, drank the Kool-Aid. And some 
because maybe their lives had not quite worked out the way they wished and they saw the Russians as a kind of elevator that they could climb on and, and, and advance. Um, and <clears throat> I just recall one conversation. I, 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 went, to, I went north out of Kharkiv uh, um, and visited some of the villages that had been on the front line and, and talked to one guy, 67-year-old, who had um, lived under Russian occupation for six months. He, he, his village was the sort of furthest forward the Russians got. Um, and he was explaining that about 120 people had stayed in his village in the neighboring settlements, 20, and one of them, seven. Uh, and funnily enough, that the, the, the Russian soldiers from, from Baratia, um, you know, from Siberia, they were sort of okay. I mean, he didn't like them, but they, they were okay. The, the ones that he said were the worst were the, were the ones from DNR the DNR guys, and he said that one DNR guy um, came up to him and uh, said that, that every fourth Ukrainian was a, was a, a Nazi, a, a, a Nazi, and that, that basically they should all be destroyed. Um, and th this is a 67-year-old man. He said, I've had two heart attacks. He said, then he punched me in the face. And I, you know, he staggered backwards. Um and it was clearly a kind of very traumatizing experience. But that man did not buckle. He said, they asked me to wear a white armband to show that I supported the occupation, and I refused. Um, and I said, well, why didn't you leave? He said, look, why should I leave? This is my home. I was born here. I will die here. This is my village. Um, and... His wife said that when, when Ukrainians kind of liberated their village a couple of weeks ago, uh, that she cried all day. Um, and th 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 that is heroism. I mean, I mean you, you know, we, we have myths, we have legends, we have Achilles, we have the, the Trojan Wars. We, but, but, but that quiet defiance, knowing actually you could be shot at any moment, that is heroism. I agree with you. I, I remember talking to several heads of villages which were occupied, around Kyiv, and every time we ask a head of a village, for example, when uh, over 90% of his uh, village dwellers have left the occupation, of course, but he or she didn't leave. Some of them, like Olga Suhenko from, uh, uh, from uh, Motizhin, were killed. Uh, but when you ask them, why didn't you leave, they all repeat the same story, because I would not leave my people. And this is also something very, very, I think, dramatic, uh, is Ukrainians are fighting for freedom, obviously, but they're also fighting for this sense of community, for this fraternity, as, as we might say. What is the emotions of Ukrainians towards the Russian occupiers? What have you, what, what have you met? Because uh, I, when I was talking to these people who lived through the occupation, the emotion that I felt most often, most frequently, was the emotion of despise, of a kind of disgust. Not real hatred, but, but a disgust. What have you seen? Yeah, no, I, I, th I think disgust, um, I think, but I mean, to go back to my earlier point, we have to recognize a few people actually welcomed this. I mean, I, I was in... Um, Shevchenkov, um, a town towards Kupinsk um, in, in, in the northeast. Uh, and I was sort of piecing together the story of a local collaborator who became a, a, a mayor. And he got the job after ripping down the, the Ukrainian trident in, in the main square um, and was then sitting in, in, in cabinet making decision, decisions discussing how Kharkiv would have a, you know, the Kharkiv region would have a referendum, the new Russian curriculum in the school all of these what you might call kind of state building projects and of course in, in the manner of all cowards he he, he ran away <laughs> with, the, with with the ukrainian army and it was presumably living in a you know living in the railway station of Belgorod now god, god knows what happened to him good luck um but we have to be clear this is a very small number of people i, I mean they exist everywhere i mean in the village i was talking about earlier out of the 120 i i, I said to this guy i said how, how many supported russia he said two Victor and Artyom, and they've both now been arrested by the SBU <laughs> Special Services. Um, so I think the vast majority, yes, regarded uh, Russian occupation, uh, Russian occupiers as 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 enemies, as uh, people that they despised, and as as people, unfortunately, who've been zombified and brainwashed by Russian propaganda. I mean, many of them still believe they are liberating Ukraine from from fascism, and and. There are these 
extraordinary kind of conversations. Uh, the priest I talked to from Snake Island said that, that when he was being interrogated, one of the questions he was asked when he was being held in Crimea is, where is Stepan Bandera? <laughs> And he said, and he said, he said, "Well, I know where Stepan Bandera is, and and that they they looked, you know, they they looked very excited." And he said, "Look, he was assassinated in Munich in 1959. <laughs> Everybody knows that. Where is Stepan Bandera?" <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, the, there is also this this war is also about lots of. Uh, Invisible people, the people who do their job, uh, the the rescuers who who do their job, the 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 doctors who uh, who work without holidays in in some hospitals in Kharkiv or near the front line. Uh, do you also see the, those stories? Do you do you see this war as because we we, we tried. In, in the West, there is some kind of this heroic image of, of Zelensky or maybe Zaluzhny of, of other people. But what I try to explain to the people that it's not Zelensky who wins this war. It's just the everyday routine work by soldiers, by rescuers, by uh, doctors, by commanders. Do you agree with that? Well, well, I, I do. And th this is something we explored when we met um, previously for, for coffee before um, the, the podcast. I mean, I, I have a chapter... Um, it's actually the penultimate chapter in my book, Invasion, which is just called Horizontal. Uh, and I'm, I'm just really intrigued by, by the idea. I mean, it was the title of a, of, of a Kuchma book that, you know, you, Ukraine is not Russia. But, but uh, basically, the, the, the reason that Ukraine is winning this war is, is because it's not Russia, because actually it is horizontally organized that... that what I've seen from the early days in Lviv, where, well, I was in Kiev on, the, on February the 24th, but then, you know, for a couple of weeks in, in, in Lviv when I was, I was watching students break off from their studies and make Molotov cocktails, not because someone told them to, but because they volunteered. I, I was, my flat in Lviv was um, outside the Terra Barona, you know, the Territorial Defense Recruiting Center, and every morning... I would see new guys, some of them some of them just returned from Poland where they were working, um, none of them with military experience, who would assemble in the square and would go off uh, to, to get basic military training before going to the front. And no one had made them do that. They had done that because they believed it. And, and some of them were already in uniform. Some of them had baseball caps and rucksacks. And it's it's the complete antithesis to what we're seeing in Russia now, where people are being compelled. It's a it's a vertical state sending them a letter, telling them they have to they have to fight and, and die in Putin's senseless war. Um, and it's completely different. And you know what what I was kind of quite interested in, which is why we talked about it, was the whole intellectual tradition in Ukraine of self organization and self government. And and you mentioned earlier on the whole Cossack experience, the kind of the the, the sort of democratically elected kind of officer um, uh, state um, in, in the sort of 16th, 17th century, you know, the whole, the whole, the whole sort of period which, which came, to, came to an end, well, slowly, but ultimately was wiped out by Catherine the Great. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's clear to anybody uh, who, who's followed Ukrainian history in recent years that, that, that this, is, this is a totally different model from, from the, the Russian model, that whenever you have a leader... Whether it's Viktor Yanukovych um, or, or or whoever who who tries to behave in a Russian style, tries to be czarist or absolutist, that there there the, the, there is a rebellion. We we saw one in two thousand and four. We had the Orange Revolution, and then in 2013, 2014. and and in, in a way, it's that the sort of grassroots uprising. It's the fact that um, Ukraine is it. It is a state, of course. It is a nation, but it's also a super organism. It's a super collective, and we've seen people coming back from Silicon Valley to help with military logistics. We've we've seen IT guys going off to fight. We've seen women making camouflage nets or just housing refugees. We have seen an incredible flourishing of of, of civil society. I mean, it, it it's been a privilege to 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 watch it and 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 to to write about it and i, I think ultimately you know that this this society this horizontally bonded society this network society will win when you look at the western discourse or western uh, or international democratic worlds uh watching this war 
are there any, for example, can you name three things that the West misunderstood about this since 2014? And probably it's high time to understand it as soon as possible. 300 things <laughs> the, the West. I mean, we haven't got time to, it's a very long list. But I, I would start about the nature of the Putin regime uh, uh, for too long has, has not been understood. And it, it's been a real problem uh, in terms of Western policymaking um, for a long time. And I, I, I like to sort of think humbly that, that my books, my writings, the stuff I've sort of said publicly in Mafia State, in, in a very expensive poison, um, a book about Alexander Litvinenko in collusion, which was a you know best-selling book in America about, about how Russia tried to influence and throw the 2016 election, presidential election, and help, helped elect Donald Trump. And also my most sort of, but before that, shadow state, which is how the Russians in, interfered over Brexit, is that um, for too long, there was a, a, a naive belief that Putin could be accommodated, that... If you yes, you know he would he he, he would he listen to all his grudges patiently, and then you could you could arrive in some mutual space where um, you could you could reach a deal and agreement with Putin, uh, and everything would be okay. Um, and and what the last twenty years tells us is that Putin is not interested and has never been interested in mutual solutions. His view is that his view of the world is there are winners and losers. So what is good for Russia is bad for America. What is good for, for Russia is bad for the European Union. Um, and his philosophy, which has become more and more blatant, uh, I, I mean, you, you might, am, am I allowed to swear on your podcast or not? Of course. Okay. Um, is, is fuck youism, basically. He just wants to fuck everything up. And, and for example, if we look at the, 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 the uh, undersea pipeline explosions with Nord Stream 1 and 2, it's a classically fuck youistic gesture. And there's only one culprit. It's clear that Russia has done this to send a signal to the Europeans that, that y- y- you think you're suffering pain. Well, there's a lot more pain we can inflict on you. That, that, that is the, the, the message. And where policymakers are now, have now finally ended up so late in the day after assassinations in Berlin and, and on the streets of London, after the, the dismantling of civil society in Russia, after... The war in Georgia in 2008, which, by the way, was a dress rehearsal for what's happening now on a kind of mini scale, um, uh, after 2014, which was essentially a war in European territory and annexation by, by Putin. Where we are now is is that we, we've gone back to the future. We've gone back, I, I think, to to uh, George, George, George Kennan, to the long telegram, to containment, that actually you cannot sit down with Putin, whether it's in Geneva or Helsinki, and make an agreement because he will break it and he will lie and he will cheat because that, that, that's, that's what he does. That's how he, he sees practical politics. So you have to contain Russia. You have to contain Russia. And I, I, I don't want to kind of hi, hi, hype how dangerous this moment is because it, it does feel a little bit dangerous. Uh, and Pu- if you hype it, you're playing Putin's game. He wants everyone to be terrified of him. But I do think now we have to be um, very cold and very rational and, and realize that, that Russia is, is a spoiler, is a sort of reckless and dangerous player in world affairs. Um, and the only way to contain Russia, I'm afraid, is with military force. Let's count it uh, as three things, because it's one thing. I, I'm sorry, long. that was a long answer, but, but basically but I you see where I'm going. Yeah. I think it's the yeah. most important one. Maybe my last question, and maybe the most difficult one, you already mentioned this, uh, that we are living in a very, very dangerous moment. We see the uh, Putin nuclear blackmail. So how should we respond to it? How the world should respond to it? Uh, And what should we be prepared for the worst? Because you said that out of different scenarios, we should be prepared maybe for the most crazy one. Well, well, yeah, I, I mean... Is Putin crazy or is he someone playing at being crazy or is he someone who acts rationally within his own dark uh, and, and largely invented parameters? I mean, I mean, the, 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 the problem with a lot of kind of a lot of sort of talking about Putin is that you, it very quickly it gets sort of criminological and you end up sort of peering into Putin's head. Now, look, we, we don't know what he's going to do. Um, uh, but for what it's worth, you know, my sense is that Putin is a coward. He's a coward. And, and moreover, he's a coward who, who is terrified about his own personal security. I mean, if, if there's, you know, one 
image of Putin out from the last two years. It is a very long table with Putin at one end and Gerasimov, his, his chief of army staff, or someone else about 25 metres away at the other end. This is a man who is terrified of death, who is terrified of his personal extinction, who believes he's, he's sent by history or God or Patriarch Kirill or whatever to do great things and needs to be alive. And the thing is, I, the Biden administration has, has, has promised huge consequences should Russia... Um, use a, a nuclear weapon, tactical or otherwise. Now, we don't know what those consequences will, will be. But if you are Putin, a, a paranoid, small individual, uh, for, whom, for whom the US's entire career has been this enormous monster, uh, you know, his fear would be there would, there would be a strike which would exterminate him. Um, and... I don't know if the Americans would try and kill Putin or not, but but I think that looms large in his thinking. And so 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 strangely enough, fiction is our ally. I, I'm not sure the Americans would try and kill him, but if Putin thinks the Americans would try and kill him, that may just save us from something terrible. Uh, and also, just lastly, I, I you know we shouldn't let Russia's presence sort of predate on our imagination, predate on our mental space. Um, sure. Russia has, has nuclear weapons, that's a fact of life, but, but so do the French, so do the Brits, so do the US. Um, and in a war between Russia and NATO, there's only one winner and it's not Russia. So, um, yeah, I mean, the Kremlin does increasingly resemble a doomsday cult, uh, a death cult. But I, I think, I think to, 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 well, not to coin a phrase, but to, to, to use a phrase which, which is... Um, a bit of a salve in dark times. I think we should keep calm and carry on. Can we win this war? By we, I mean not only Ukraine, but the free world. Can we win this war? I, I, think, I think we can win this war. Uh, I mean, it depends, obviously, how you define win. I mean, if, if you define win as restoring uh, all of Ukraine's territory, including Crimea, uh, neutering and dis disabling Russia and getting rid of its sort of militaristic potential, well, I mean, that, that's, that's quite a big ask. But um, if, if winning means Ukraine surviving as a, as a sovereign state, uh, coherent, um, united, um, with, with a clear sense of its own identity and where it's going in terms of European integration um, on a westward, irrevocable west, westward trajectory, then I think Ukraine has already won. Um, and, you know, let's see what happens on, on the battlefield. But I, I sort of think that, you know, the, the, one of the paradoxes of, of, of Putin's disastrous and terrible invasion is that, that he is reminded the, the West, and I hate to talk about the West because it's, it's, it's not really, you know, it's a lot of, lot of very different countries, but let, let's say reminded the democratic world of what's important. And um, what, what's important is respect for human life, decency, um, universal values, the, the idea that, Actually, if you live in a village, you, you have a right to 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 you know be, be safe without being shelled, bombed, uh, interrogated, shot, punched in the face, etc. So, so I, I would hope that we have discovered, rediscovered some kind of common purpose, um, and that um, tyranny will not prevail. But uh, that that actually we 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 will win, and unfortunately for Ukraine, Ukraine is really at the front line of this civilizational struggle. That is where I agree with Putin. It, it is actually a war between Russia and the West taking place here. Um, I remember talking to Vitaly Kim, um, uh, the governor of Mykolaiv. I interviewed him um, over the summer. And he said, yeah, it's a war between good and evil. And I said, Vitaly, the problem is the good guys don't always win. And he said, yes, they do. So let, let's hope the good guys win. Luke Harding, thank you for this conversation. Thank you. This was an episode of Thinking in Dark Times, a podcast series by Ukraine World. In this episode, I spoke to Luke Harding, The Guardian's correspondent on Ukraine, Russia and Eastern Europe. I asked him about the experience covering the Russian invasion of Ukraine, about the atrocities of the Russian army and about Ukrainian political identity. My name is Vladimir Yermolenko, I'm a Ukrainian philosopher and journalist and chief editor of ukraineworld.org. 
Thinking Dark Times is aiming to make Ukraine and the current war a focal point of our common reflection about the world's present, past and future. We try to see light through and despite the current darkness. You can support us at patreon.com slash ukraineworld. patreon.com slash ukraineworld. Stay with us and stand with Ukraine.